this right eventually. The final talk is uh, reverse cycle working and uh, its applications by Sarah Miracle, Scott Yerek. Uh, all right, can you hear me? Yes, all right. I'm not sure I still have this right, but um, all right. That is not my slides. All right, um, I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. We'll see if I can figure out the technology. Okay, um, so I'm gonna talk about the following problem. All right, suppose you're given um, a block cipher on a set T, and you have a smaller set S, which is a subset of T, and our goal is to use our block cipher on our set T to find a block cipher on our smaller set S. All right, um, I'm gonna give you a new algorithm to do this, um, and I'm gonna start off by telling you a story um, to motivate this problem. Then I'll give you the new algorithm, or I'll give you a little bit of background on the problem and existing solutions. I'll tell you about our new algorithm, um, and then I'm going to end by giving you a few proof details, but there won't be too many of them, so I'll go through that pretty quickly. All right, um, and this is joint work with Scott Yellick. Great. All right. Old-fashioned way. Okay, um, so this is motivated by the application of uh, the uh, by format preserving encryption. Uh, so here's the setup. Suppose you have an existing database that stores um, some sort of information. So for example, maybe you have an existing database with millions of US social security numbers already set up there, right? So your customers have applications, there's hardware, software involved, it's already set up. Um, and you come back later and decide, hey, we want to add encryption to this database. So how are you going to do this? Um, and this data that you have has some special conditions. So for example, for social security numbers, these are nine digit numbers. Um, and there are some restrictions. For example, the first three digits can't be 666. And there are all kinds of other uh, restrictions associated uh, with this data. OK, so how are you going to do this? Well, one basic first pass idea um, is we could represent these social security numbers as 30-bit numbers pad with some extra zeros, and then encrypt using just standard block cipher. But in some cases, this doesn't work, uh, because the encrypted numbers have a significantly different format, uh, could have a significantly different format from the original format. And this can cause all sorts of problems with your application, hardware, software, et cetera, that you don't want to have to fix. Uh, so the idea is that we want to generate um, ciphertexts that have the same format as the original uh, data. So these are actually valid social security numbers. They don't start with 666, et cetera. All right, so that's our goal. Um, and uh, all right, so let me go ahead and tell you a little bit about the background um, and what we know so far, and then I'll tell you about our new algorithm. OK, so um, in many settings, we already have solutions that can do this. So for example, if you're set S, um, our bit strings or integers up to nine, there's lots of work uh, showing how to solve the problem in these cases. Um, also, if your target set S has an efficient way to rank or unrank the elements in your set, then you can simply use this algorithm um, and then a cipher on the set of integers from zero up to the size of your set minus one. Um, so we're looking at the situation um, where basically all we know how to do is test membership in the set S. So we know how to find uh, whether something is in the set S or not, but that's just about it. Okay, so here's the general approach. Um, to this problem is, again, we, we find a cipher on some larger set T, uh, which contains our set as a subset. Then we transform it uh, into a cipher on our smaller set S. And this is the problem I, I inter started with at the very beginning. Um, so for example, in the social security setting, um, we can use the larger set S, let that be uh, the set of 30-bit strings. Um, we have many ways to encipher this. And then we need to tackle the second step, right? So how do we take this cipher on the set T and get a cipher 
on the smaller set. Um, and one of the you know, kind of canonical ways to do this uh, is called cycle walking. And the idea is that if you have a point um, in your smaller set S, you evaluate the permutation on your larger set. Uh, and you check, OK, did I get a point that happens to be an S, right? Because we can test membership in S. And if you get a point in S, great, you're done. If you get a point in T, well, you do it again, OK? And if now you get a point in S, again, you're done. If it's a point in T, you keep going. And basically, you do this until you hit a point in S. Um, and you're always going to eventually hit a point in S, because maybe you'll come all the way back around to the point itself, but you'll get there eventually. OK. So um, we're going to take a look at this algorithm um, from the cycle structure perspective, because it will be useful when I introduce our new algorithm. But essentially, um, if you look at your permutation on T in the cycle structure, uh, the effect of cycle walking is simply to cross out all the elements in S, or sorry, all the elements that aren't in S, and we're left with a permutation on S. OK, pretty straightforward so far, hopefully. <laughs> All right, um, so cycle walking was formally analyzed by Black and Rogaway in 2002. Um, and they showed, or well, as you can see, right, there's running time of this algorithm um, is, has expected running time of constant time, assuming that the size of S is a small, is a constant fraction of T. Um, but in the worst case, it's not so great, right? Because in order to evaluate a single point in S, we might have to go through Basically, every single point, in the worst case, every single point that's in T but not in S before we find a point in S. OK? Um, in addition, right, this algorithm can take different times depending on the permutation and depending on the point. Um, so it's possible that maybe uh, these, the fact that we have um, different running times can leak some sort of information. Um, now, Belair, Ristin, Part, Ragaway, and Steegers did show that in a certain setting, uh, this doesn't actually leak any information, and it's not damaging, but you can envision that maybe there's a setting where this could cause problems. OK, so the question, uh, our, our algorithm, or what we looked at, uh, was can we do better? So can we improve this worst case running time, and can we come up with an algorithm uh, that doesn't leak any timing information? All right, so finally, our algorithm. Okay, so. Let's consider the cycle structure. You know, one, one idea you might have uh, is can we somehow cut this algorithm off early, right? Can we somehow, you know, if, if we're in that worst case situation, can we cut it off early and maybe just accept some sort of error? Um, but it's not clear how to do this with cycle walking because we still need to end up with an actual permutation, right? Somehow we have to get a point in S. Uh, so, so here's the idea. Um, so we're going to go ahead and take our point that we want to evaluate, and we're going to evaluate our permutation on T. Um, and if we get a point in S, then again, we're going to stop, just like we did in cycle walking. But if instead we get a point that's not in S, a point in T, so for example, um, if we're trying to find out what 2 gets mapped to, then instead of continuing on, we're actually going to go backwards instead. OK, so we're going to go backwards until we hit a point that's not in S. Um, and essentially what this is going to do, the effect it's going to have on the cycle structure is, again, we're getting rid of all the points that aren't in S, but now we're only looking at contiguous points in S. OK, so we're only looking at contiguous points in S. So this single cycle here in our original permutation is going to get broken up into two different cycles, which are the contiguous points in S. OK, so if you're following me so far, you're probably thinking to yourself, wait a second. This hasn't actually improved the worst case running time too much, right? Because in the worst case, we still might have to go through every point in S. And if S is a constant fraction of T, then all right, this is, this is not very satisfying. OK, I mean, it's a smaller constant fraction, but OK. So here's the further idea, and that is uh, that we're just going to look at two cycles. OK, so, so we're going to look at these contiguous uh, points in S. And if there are more than two points, we're just going to get rid of them, all right? So we're only going to look at two cycles. Um, and so we're going to be left with essentially a matching at that um, point. OK, so just to give you another example, again, we're eliminating all the points that aren't in S. Um, and then we're only looking at the continuous points. And any cycle that's longer than two, we're just going to get rid of. And we're going to map all those points to themselves. OK, so, so here are the formal details of the algorithm. Um, it, 
It's not as complex as it looks, uh, but we've added a, an extra bit flip. So in addition, those points that get mapped to something besides themselves, we're going to flip a bit. Uh, and if the bit you know, flips one way, we're going to use that pair. If not, we're just going to map those points to themselves. Um, and this actually happens to, to be useful when we get to the proof, which we probably won't go into too much detail today. Um, but the big thing to note is that you only have to evaluate the permutation on three different points in the worst case. So in the worst case, it takes constant time. OK, so, so one, um, in, in every case, it takes constant time. So right, one step takes constant time, that's great. But um, even if the permutation on t is random, this new permutation that we've generated is certainly not random, right? Um, and you can pretty easily see that in that a lot of points are going to get mapped to themselves, right? Um, so this isn't random. It's not even a random matching. Or, um, and it's not a uniformly random matching. Um, so the question becomes, OK, so, so it's not random. But if we do it enough times, it is random. Uh, so now we ask the question, how many times do we have to repeat this process before we get a permutation that's close to random? Um, and at this point, this is essentially a Markov chain. Um, and we can use techniques from the Markov chain community to answer this question of how many times do we have to apply the algorithm, and we're really hoping it's more than, it's you know, less than the size of s, uh, to get an improvement on this algorithm. And it turns out the answer um, is log logarithmic in the size of t. So this is going to get us uh, an improvement in the running time. OK, so what are the advantages of this algorithm? Um, so we have an improvement in the worst case running time uh, from O of, all right, so now I'm, I'm switching to, to Markov chain community tomorrow, right? So n is the size of t um, here. So we go from linear to logarithmic uh, in this worst case. Uh, we have no leaked timing information here. So everything is going to take the same amount of time to evaluate. In addition, we can now trade off security and running time. So you can choose, OK, you know, maybe I don't want to do the full log n steps. I can make a trade off depending on how secure or how random I need my permutation to be. Um, in addition, we're going to have some other benefits, uh, like increasing the level of security. Uh, and the reason we get some of these, and I won't go into too much detail on it, uh, is that essentially we only need to evaluate the points in S. We don't need to evaluate the entire uh, permutation in the worst case. OK. All right, so I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of these proof details, um, and, but not too much detail. OK. so. Um, uh, this question of how many times do we need to apply the algorithm before it's close to random um, is essentially uh, the question of what's the mixing time of this Markov chain. So I have it defined formally here, but essentially we're looking at how long do we have to go before the variation distance uh, is less than uh, some epsilon. Okay, so um, in order to, uh, to bound the mixing time, uh, we're going to show that our algorithm leads, uh, yields what's called a matching exchange process. Um, and a matching, I'll tell you what that is in a second. Uh, but essentially, it was defined uh, and analyzed by Sumaj and Kulowski in 2000. Um, and we're able to use a lot of the same techniques that they did to come up with a bound uh, on the running time of our algorithm. Um, uh, and we do do uh, some modifications, and we dig into uh, their proof, um, and we give some explicit bounds. So they give a big O bound, but no constants. Um, and we reprove several of the key lemmas in the context of our setting. So they, they prove a, a more general bound in a more general setting. Um, OK, so we do some customizations for our algorithm. Um, so I'm going to start off telling you what the matching exchange process is, and then I'll dig in a little bit into the details. OK, so a matching exchange process works as follows. You begin by choosing a number kappa according to some distribution. Then you pick a matching of size kappa uniformly at random. And then for each pair of the, in the matching, you're going to transpose the two points with probability a half and otherwise do nothing. And this is where that bit flip in our algorithm comes in to play. Um, so it's pretty straightforward to see that our algorithm is a matching exchange process. Although we're not uh, generating the matchings uniformly at random, a matching of a certain, if we look at the, all the matchings of a certain size, those all have the same probability. All right. Okay, and um, their theorem says that as long as the expected value of kappa is O of n, then a matching exchange process mixes in time O of log n. 
Okay, so um, in order to you know, analyze the mixing time of this process, uh, your first pass approach um, might be to use uh, the technique of path coupling, which is a fairly standard approach in the Markov chain community. And essentially what you do is you take a look, um, in, in our setting, you're going to take a look at two permutations, um, and we're, we're thinking about these now as permutations on S, um, that differ by a single transposition, so a transposition of a single uh, pair of points. Um, and then we're going to take, we're going to simulate our process um, on those two different permutations. And the time that it takes until our process meets gives us a bound on the mixing time. Okay, so when we apply this in our setting, um, we, and we consider two configurations that differ by a single transposition. Um, and if the first matching uh, that we get at, each, at the first step, um, if it contains the specific pair, then we can essentially use this matching for one of our process, or use this pair for one of our processes and not use it for the other one. And the two matchings, uh, the two uh, permutations will meet after a single step. Um, if it doesn't contain this pair, there's not a lot we can do. Um, and the problem is that this pair only comes up with probability um, one over n. Okay, so this isn't going to work because this will give us a bound of n log n, which really hasn't helped us at all. It just got worse. Okay, so what they do in the case of the matching exchange process to get a better bound, uh, here's the high-level approach. Instead of looking at what happens to this process over a single step, they look at what happens over log n steps. Okay, so they look at it over a longer period of time um, using a technique uh, that's called delayed path coupling. In addition, they're going to use what's called a non-Markovian coupling, so they're going to use some information about what happens in the later steps to choose some of these matchings for the, process, the two processes. Um, okay, so, so I'm just going to get, again, I'm going to do this fairly quickly, give you a high-level idea of how this works. Um, okay, so, so again, we have these two processes that we're trying to simulate. They start by differing by a single transposition, and we want to see how long it takes before they couple, and we're looking over log n steps. Um, and one of the requirements is that if we look at a single one of these processes, it needs to look like our algorithm, right? So if we just look at that one in isolation, it has to look like our algorithm, but, but we can do things to, to help them along as long as they, again, if you just look at one, it looks like the process. Okay, so for one of our processes, we're just going to choose the matchings like we would with the algorithm straight off, all right? But we're going to be selective in how we choose the matchings for the second process. All right, so here's the idea. Again, if these, since these two processes start by differing by a single transposition, if we get that particular transposition, we're, we're good, right? We're golden, if we happen to get that particular transposition. But that doesn't occur, that's not very likely to occur, right? That, that's our problem. But what is likely to occur is that our two points, U and V, get matched with other points, right? So maybe U gets matched with Z, and V gets matched with W, and this is likely to occur. And so what we can do is then, you know, and we could choose these two matchings so that after one step, they differ by the U, V transposition, but we can also choose the matching so that after one step, they differ by this Z, W transposition, okay? And if in the next step after that, we happen to get either of these two transpositions, the U, V, or the Z, W, then we can fix everything. And essentially, the, the key important fact is that now the number of transpositions that fix our problem, now there's twice as many after one step. And essentially, we can show that after two steps, there are four times as many, and they double. And so we can take a look. Um, and because these transpositions are doubling, we end up showing that after log n steps, we're going to have enough so that we're highly likely to hit one of these good pairs um, after that many steps. So that was pretty much all the detail I want to give, give you about that. But OK. All right, so we're going to call these good pairs. And essentially, the parts that we prove is we're going to show that after log n steps, uh, with high probability, we're going to have a linear number of these good pairs, and thus after, um, and then we can show that with high probability, one of the next log n matchings is going to contain one of these good pairs, and that's the part that, that we end up reproving. Okay, so um, in terms of future directions, 
It's, you know, there's obviously things we can do to improve the algorithm. We don't think that this bit flip is necessary. It's really just a, it's, you know, makes the proof go through, but I don't think it actually improves the algorithm. Um, uh, but, but, you know, I think the more important one is that uh, this expected uh, constant running time that you get with cycle walking is very attractive, right? And we, we certainly don't achieve that, right? It, it's going to take us um, logarithmic time every time. So it's consistent and it has a better worst case running time, but it'd be nice to, to go back to that constant time. That, that looks very nice, right? Okay, that's it. Any questions? A question on the comments? So I was trying to go through a mental calculation on uh, particular uh, concrete uh, numbers and something uh, seems to be wrong. Maybe I misunderstood your algorithm, but mm -hmm. you gave the example of t being 2 to the 30, and uh, uh, let's look at uh, s, which is 2 to the 20. So one in a thousand uh, numbers are uh, good, num uh, good values. So if you are looking at a random permutation, the chance that uh, a, a given good point is followed by an, another good point is only one in uh, 2 to the 10, one in a thousand. So almost all the numbers uh, are going to be singletons in your uh, construction. Well, let me continue. So uh, the probability that uh, you are going to have uh, a pair uh, or larger cycle is going to be smaller than uh, 1,000 due to the additional uh, bit flip that you mentioned. Now you are repeating the whole thing only 30 times. And in 30 times, with the probability of one in a thousand, almost always uh, the singleton will be mapped to itself in the first uh, application, second application, up to the 30th application. So with very high probability, still every point will be mapped to itself in your example. You somehow uh, don't consider at all the ratio between S and T. You just do the number of iterations to be log T, regardless of how small S is within the range. Yes, yeah, so um, I've, I've hidden a little of those details from you. You're perfectly correct. Um, so the uh, numbers that I give you assume that S uh, is a constant fraction oh, of T. Then it will yeah. work. When you look at the uh, theorems in the paper, everything is in turn, right? That ratio of the size of S to the size of T is critical, and that shows up in every theorem because oh, it affects. Fine. But yeah. you didn't say this is a crucial yeah. element, mm -hmm. this parameter of yeah, so size it, of T to the yeah. size of S. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we assume it's a constant fraction. A question? Thanks for the talk. Um, I had a question about whether you could generalize this argument. So it looks like right now you're sort of pairing up elements and then swapping or not. Could you take triples of elements or quadruples and, and permute them? Does that still work? Does the proof not work? What yeah, happens? so that's a great question. I mean, we, we, that was our original idea. Because I mean, ideally, right, if you, have, if you allow longer cycles, it should take fewer steps before it gets to be random, right? Because it's closer to what the original permutation looks like. Um, but we haven't gotten the proof to work out. So presumably there's some trade-off, right? If you allow longer uh, cycles, you wouldn't have to go as many steps. But we, we don't have a theorem that's general in that case. But you should be able to get that. Just, uh, going a little bit further. If you go a little bit further in your attempt to find another good point. No, true, but what happens to the yeah, the proof falls through. I mean, you can do it. And it I mean, clearly it should be faster. But how much faster is, no, we're not sure. Other question? Comment? Okay, let's thank Sarah and all speakers again. Okay?